here in uh, we're just here uh, near Ruby Creek y'all may have heard the uh, Ruby Creek incident with uh, George and Jeannie Chapman um, I think it happened back in 1941 there's just there's this property here that I just walked past it uh, it's all private and stuff, but it could possibly be. They know something in there. I'm pretty sure they do. It's a nice piece of property there. I just noticed something here. I'm trying to get at it. I'm just walking up the highway number seven here. I, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I can get to what I've seen without trespassing, but gonna try there's a lot of thorn bushes too So this is what I noticed from the highway. Just driving past. I can't actually get down in there. I could, but I'm not going to. You guys see that? Looks to me like a massive tree that's been uprooted and inserted upside down into the ground. I'm not gonna get all torn up, but you can see you can see this right from the highway. I don't even know how I caught it, but uh, I seen that. That's really old. That's been there for a long time. And uh, yeah, we're just, we're literally right next to, we're very near Ruby Creek. We're going to head to the, uh, we're gonna head to the Chapman Farm. I'm not sure if this Chapman Farm is the same relation to the Chapman family or not, but uh, we're gonna head there and uh, check it out. 
to maybe ask some questions, see if they'll allow us on camera, see if they'll go on camera or not. None of this has been uh, pre prearranged, so I don't know what to expect. I don't know what they're gonna say or if they're gonna try to shoot me for driving onto their driveway or not. But from the uh, Chapman Farm. We got Ruby Creek Road ahead here. So I'm guessing right here is Ruby Creek. And there it is, there's the sign, Ruby Creek. nations place in there This article comes out of BigfootEncounters.com The Bigfoot Classics Stories about Sasquatch have been appearing in print from time to time since the 1860s. I have clippings in my files from almost every year since the early 1920s. But the modern history of Sasquatch really dates from September 1941, when one of the creatures paid a visit in broad daylight to an Indian family named Chapman. While Indian stories may have been dismissed as legend or laughed off because Indians are not supposed to be reliable, this existence was accompanied by too much physical evidence to be ignored. Chapman family consisted of George and Jeannie Chapman and children numbering at my visit for Mr. Chapman worked on the railroad and was living at that time in a small place called Ruby Creek, 30 miles up the Fraser River from Agassiz, British Columbia in Canada's great western province. It was about three in the afternoon on a sunny, cloudless day when Jeannie Chapman's eldest son, then age nine, came running to the host saying there was a cow coming down out of the woods at the foot of the nearby mountains. The other kids, a boy age seven and a little girl age five, were playing in the field behind the host bordering the rail track. As Chapman went out to look, since the boy seemed oddly disturbed and they saw what at first she thought was a very big bear moving a boat among the bushes that border the field beyond the railway tracks. She called the two children who came running immediately. Then the creature moved onto the tracks 
she saw to her horror that it was a gigantic man covered with hair, not fur. The hair seems to be about four inches long all over and of a pale yellow-brown color. To pin down this color, Miss Chapman pointed out to me a sheet of lightly varnished plywood in the room where we were sitting. This was of a brown orsher color. This creature advanced directly towards the house, and Miss Chapman had, as she put it, too much time to look at it because she stood her ground outside while the eldest boy, on her instruction, got a blanket from the house and rounded up the other children. The kids were in a panic, she told us, and it took two to three minutes to get the blanket during the time which the creature had reached the near corner of the field only about a hundred feet away from her. Miss Chapman then spread the blanket and holding it aloft so the kids could not see the creature or it them. She backed off at the double to the old field and down on the river's beach out of sight. She then ran with the kids downstream to the village. I asked her a leading question about the blanket. Had her purpose in using it and to prevent the kids from seeing the creature in accord with alleged American Indian belief that to do so would bring bad luck or even death. Her reply was both prompt and surprised. She said that although she had heard white men tell that belief, she had not heard it from her parents or any other people whose advice regarding the so-called Sasquatch had been simply not to go further than certain points up certain valleys and to run if she saw one and not to struggle if one caught her as it might squeeze her to death by mistake. No, she said, I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids and so it might go into the house and look for them instead of following me. This seemed to have been sound logic as the creature did go into the house and also rummaged through the old oat house pretty throughly, hauling from it a 55 gallon barrel of salt fish, breaking this open and scattering its contents throughout the house. The irony of it all, those three children did die within three years, the two boys by drowning and the little girl on a sick bed. And just after the interview, the Chapmans, they also were drowned in the Fraser River when a robo capsized. Miss Chapman told me that the creature was about seven and a half feet tall. She could estimate its height by various fence and line posts standing in the field. It had a rather small head and very short, thick neck. In fact, really no neck at all. A point that was emphasized by William Rowe and by the others who claimed to have seen one of these creatures. Its body was entirely human in the shape except that it was extremely thick throughout its chest and its arms were exceptionally long. She did not see the feet which were in the grass. Its shoulders were very wide and it had no breast from which Miss Chapman assumed as it was a male though she also did not see any male genitals due to the long hair covering up its groin. She was most definite on one point. The naked parts of its face and hands were much darker than its hair. It appeared to be almost black. George Chapman returned home from his work day on the railroad shortly before six in the evening and by a route that passed by the village so he saw no one to tell him what happened. When he reached his house, he immediately saw the woodshed door battered in and spotted enormous humanoid footprints all over the place, greatly alarmed, for he, like all of his people, had heard since his childhood, big wild men of the mountains, though he did not hear the word Sasquatch till after this incident, he called for his family and then dashed through the house. Then he spotted the foot tracks of his wife and kids going up towards the river. He followed these until he picked up on them on the sandy bedside of the river. He noticed them going downstream without any signs of the giant ones. Somewhat relieved, he 
He was retracing his steps when he stumbled across the giant's foot tracks at the river's bank further upstream. These had come down out of the potato patch which lay between the house and the river, had milled about the river and then gone back up through the old field towards the foot of the mountains where they disappeared in the heavy growth. Returning to the house, relieved to know that the tracks of all four of his family had gone off downstream to the village. George Chapman went to examine the woodshed. In our interview after 18 years, he still expresses volatile astonishment that any living thing, even a seven foot six inch man with a barrel chest could lift a 55 gallon tub of fish and break it open without even using a tool. He confirmed this creature's height after finding a number of long brown hairs stuck to the slab wood of the doorway above the level of his head. George Chapman then went off to the village to look for his family and found them in a state of calm collapse. He gathered them up and invited his father-in-law and two others to return with him for protection of his family when he was away at work. The foot tracks returned every night for a week and on two occasions, the dogs that the Chapmans had taken with them set up the most awful rackets at exactly two o'clock in the morning. The Sasquatch did not, however, molest them or apparently touch either the houses or the woodshed. But the whole business was too unnerving and the family finally moved out and never went back. After a long chat about this and other matters, Miss Chapman suddenly told us something very significant. Just as we were leaving, she said, it made an awful funny noise. I asked her if she could imitate the noise for me, but it was her husband who did so, saying that he heard it at night twice during the weeks after the first incident. He then proceeded to utter the exactly the same gurgling whistle that the other men in California who said they had heard a Bigfoot call had given us. This sound I cannot reproduce in print, but I can assure you that it's unlike anything I have ever heard given by man or beast anywhere on the world. To me, this information is of great significance that an American Indian couple of British Columbia should give out the exact same strange sound in connection with a Sasquatch that two highly educated white men did over 600 miles south in the connection with the California Bigfoot. This is incredible. If this is a hoax or a publicity stunt or mass hallucination, as some people have claimed, how does it happen that this noise, which defies description, always sounds the same no matter who has tried to reproduce it to me? These were probably the last words on the Sasquatch that the Chapmans uttered, and I absolutely refuse to listen to anybody who might say that they were lying. Admittedly, honest men are such a rarity as possibly to be non-existent but I have met a few who could qualify and I put the Chapman near the head of the list. This article I just read was written by Ivan T. Sanderson and it was out of True Magazine in March 1960.
publisher of a newspaper at Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia, began investigating some of these sightings. Here is John Green to report on a sighting he investigated in 1957. When I first came here in about 1957, it was still pretty well open. But all this has, has grown up since then. So uh, what happened at that time was that uh, Mrs. George Chapman, who lived in a house down by the river behind me here, uh, she was in the house and the children were outside. One of them came in and told her that there was a cow coming out of the woods. So she looked out and she saw this man-like thing, but uh, about eight feet tall and completely covered with hair like a bear. And uh, she knew it to be a Sasquatch. Uh, this was, you know, quite a well-known thing to the Indian people. And she was frightened, so she took the children, ran down to the river, and then through the graveyard, which is right behind me here, and uh, came out just about here onto the track and then uh, ran on down to Ruby Creek. So uh, she'd really only had one quick look at the thing. So uh, it wouldn't be that convincing a story, except that a lot of people immediately went back there and saw these enormous tracks. Uh, Mr. Tifting, of course, was one of them and uh, can describe uh, just what the tracks were like and what they did. Well, they came through the bush into the shed or the lean-to of the house. And there was a bottle of dried fish or smoked salmon, rather. And he broke the bowl, and there was some fish eaten there and thrown around. And then he went down the river bank, and apparently took a drink, and then come back up on the other side of the house, through the garden patch, and up to CPR fence, and stepped with one foot on that side of the fence and one foot on this side of the fence. I can walk right over it. And the footprints was about 18 inches, like. And then he went across there and over to the next fence there and went right up the hillside. And that's as far as we could follow him. Like I said, I have no idea what to expect here. Just get a no trespassing sign, so. The Chapmans were uh, our uh, First Nations. They were First Nations as well, so. Uh, probably shouldn't be going down here, but. Uh, community. It's a First Nations reserve here. Everywhere is private, no trespassing.
not 100% positive, but I think this could possibly be the Chapman, the Chapman home here. This is an office to some real estate thing right now. And, uh, just looking around here, not sure where where they are. So I don't think I'm wanted here at all. People are uh, staring at me all over the place. I found this old article. See these two spruce trees in the uh, photo? That's where the house used to sit right next to those spruce trees. Look what I found right here. They're much bigger now, but those are the two, those are the two spruce trees. There's the mountain. You can see the mountain there, it all lines up. The house used to be right there to the left of the spruce trees. I'll go around the other side of the road and take a closer look from there. I know all the people this little community wondering what the hell I'm doing walking around filming. It's like a, there's a little green ladder or something there too. So that's it. Those are the two spruce trees. Where the uh, George and Jeannie Chapman's Post used to be. Pretty awesome. But again, I don't think I'm supposed to be on this property. So, the uh, First Nations police or RCMP show up, you'll know why. Yeah, it's definitely them. That's where the home, that's where the incident happened. It was probably, <clears throat> none of this stuff was here then. It was probably just that one home. And I actually searched just Chapman's, Chapman house or whatever, and it brought me here. But yeah, it didn't bring me to any certain location. It just brought me to, to these trees here. So. That's where it all took place, right there to the right of the tree, it would be. I'm not gonna go in there anymore and bother these people. You guys down here looking for Sasquatch too? 
Uh, I see you guys down here looking for Sasquatch too. <laughs> Interesting dudes there. I should, uh, this is it. This is Ruby Creek. I should, uh, go talk to those guys. They're on the other side. Ah, fuck. It's fucking flip flops now. Fucking done. Just went into the weed store there because it's right next to the uh, right next to the creek. Just trying to ask them if there's any access to the creek other than under the bridge. I wanted to go down there and uh, talk to you guys a bit under there, but uh, it's just too loud. All the cars driving over the uh, bridge and stuff. But the, they knew all about the uh, the Chapman incident. And actually, the reserve on this side of the road across the street here is actually called. The Chapman Reserve, and it's named after it's named after uh, that family, the Chapmans. And then on this back side of the road here, that's another Native Reserve. So there's literally no access to that river unless you uh, know some of the people from those reserves, which I don't. And I'm not going to go banging on doors asking go down in there so there's really not a whole lot I can do here I can't really uh, I just can't get access so I wanted to go explore around a bit in, this, in the forest but uh, I don't want to get in shit either so be a second part to this ruby creek incident coming soon next time i'm in the area i will be heading back very soon i drive through this area very frequently instead of me focusing on trying to get on the actual ruby creek 
next time I will venture up into these mountains here. Um, I'm going to say that it's this mountain here on this side of the river. The, the Sasquatch could have possibly walked across the uh, Fraser River from the other mountain range over there. But uh, we will go in search of these forest giants. And uh, there's a few forest roads I think I can get a bit closer to as well. And uh, stay tuned for that in search of the Ruby Creek Giants. Yeah.